the world's greatest love story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, everywhere we turn today, we see tragedies, and most of what we hear is bad news. Well, I've come to bring you some good news in the midst of this bad news. You know, this is a sadly sick society. If people think that they can find peace of mind in pills, they're trying to eat their way to ecstasy, they're trying to drink their way to pleasure, they're trying to smoke their way to settle nerves and puff their way to popularity and push their way to power, bully their way to friendship and bum their way to world peace. But I know where a poor man has a chance, where a sick man can get well, an ignorant man can become wise, a bad man can be made good, a good man can be made better, and even a dead man can be made alive in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not have, should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no other passage in all of the Bible that says so much to so many in so few words. Now here we have a volume in a verse, an ocean in a dewdrop, and a continent in a cup. Here we have the world's greatest love story. It's even the anthem of redemption. You see, you start out saying it and you wind up singing it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now someone has said it's too fair to touch, it's too good to be true, and it's too far away to be real. And the cynics are asking, is it so? If it is so, so what? Well, I've come to say that it is so. This phenomenon is beyond the kin of human comprehension. For the love of God is broader than the measure of a man's mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. God's love is real. It had no beginning and will have no end. It cannot change because God cannot change. God cannot change for the better, and he can't change for the worse. He can't change for the better because he's the very embodiment of excellence himself. And he can't change for the worse because he's, there's nothing in his power or will to hurt himself. So we just join with the writer of the Hebrews in saying he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is real. His love is everlasting. God does not love us because we are lovely or lovable. His love does not exist on account of our, our character, but on account of His. God does not love us because we are valuable, but we are valuable because God loves us. God does not love us because Jesus died for us, but Jesus died for us because God loves us. His love is stronger than sin, it's deeper than sorrow, and it's mightier than death. Yes, I said this is not only the world's greatest love story, but it's the anthem of redemption. And this music is written in the key of B, B saved. And in this mu music there are four movements. Movement number one gives us the cause of salvation. If you really want to know the cause of salvation, is for God so loved the world. Movement number two gives us the cost of salvation. Now, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It doesn't cost the, any, the sinner anything, but it costs God his only begotten son. Movement number three gives us the condition of salvation, that whosoever believeth in him. 
And then movement number four gives us the consequences of salvation. And here you have a double promise. One should not perish and two shall have everlasting life. You know, men have some weird concepts of God. Some have a Lone Ranger concept. They think that God is standing around ready to hop into our lives only when we need it. And then some have a granddaddy concept of God. They refer to him as the old man of stairs. They think that he's having trouble with his legs and he's not able to get down to see about us all. And then some have a philosophical concept of God. Uh, they say that God is man's problem and man is going to have to solve his problem. And then you remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpins and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool had said in his heart there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions like who assassinated God, what coroner was called, and who signed his death certificate, and who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased. In what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. God is spirit. He does not die by assassination. He does not die by pronouncement. He does not die by denial. He just does not die. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you'll trust him, he will be as true to you as he was to Abram when Abram was called to go out not knowing whether he went. If you'll trust him, he will be as evident to you as he was to Moses when God manifested himself in a burning bush. Now, when they couldn't get anywhere with the God is dead idea, now in these 70s, one of the top theological questions is, where did God come from? Now, the primary purpose of God in creation was to prepare a moral being spiritual and intellectually capable of worshiping him. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and void formlessness, and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty did live and love alone. He called light out of darkness, he called cosmos out of chaos, he called order out of confusion. But the question still clamors for an answer, where did God come from? The answer is he came from nowhere. Now that's theologically correct and it's biblically sound. For Habakkuk said, I saw him when he left the hills of Teman, the Holy One from Mount Perrin. And Teman simply means nothing or nowhere. So he came from nowhere. I made that statement in Detroit some time ago and a man talked with me after the meeting and he said, Preacher, let's be reasonable about this thing. You were up there tonight talking about God came from nowhere. So let's be reasonable. I said, all right. If you just want to be reasonable about it, the reason God came from nowhere, there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And stand on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and caught something when there was nothing to catch. And hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. Now you'll find that in Job 26 and 7 that he hung this world on nothing. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will, and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence, and sparks flew therefrom. And he caught them on the tips of his fingers, and flung them out into space, and bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. 
The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything. So God himself said, that's good. <laughs> and God so loved the world, the world, all that God made, everything and everybody, he made it and he loves it. God loves every human being. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, how long you've been in sin. God loves you. No individual can go out of here saying no one loves you. God loves you. He so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now these two verbs, loved and gave, work together inevitably and invariably. You don't really have one without the other. There's no real love without giving. No real love without giving. Lady, you can listen all you want to that sweet speech that that guy is making, talking about he loves you. But if he doesn't back it up with giving, he really doesn't love. Because when you love, you give. God so loved the world that he gave. You see, and you don't have any real giving without love. If someone hands you something and he has to brag about it and tell it all over town what he had to do for you, you just soon to hand it back to him. When you discern that there's no love in it, there's no real giving without love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's good news. Now the gospel is good news, but did you know the gospel is bad news first? You've got to have bad news before you can appreciate good news. The wages of sin is death. That's the gospel and that's bad news. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's good news. What I'm trying to say, the bad news comes first. You've got to have uh, bad news before you can appreciate good news. You see, you've got to have valleys before you can have mountains. If you didn't have any valleys, you wouldn't have any mountains. If everything is on the same plane, then there's no mountains. You've got to have bad news. Life is so constituted that you have to have the good and the bad. You'd have to have the sunshine and darkness. When these instrumentalists play, these instruments, they play the black and the white keys. You've got to have them both. So bad news comes before good news. But the good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him and I don't need to go any further whosoever believeth in him you see when I first heard that and heeded it it did away with my inferiority complex it let me know what I was talking about here it let me know you don't have to be uh, have to have certain parents just whosoever believeth in him it lets you know that you don't have to be of a certain race, just believe in him. You don't have to have a certain amount of education, just believe in him. You don't have to have money in the bank, believe in him. Think about it, I'm glad that you don't have to go around and get a long list of references. Just believe in him. And I'm glad of another thing, you don't have to wait for the vote of the church. Just believe in him. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's good news. You know, there was a time when man wallowed in sin without a savior, groped in darkness without light, struggled in bondage without redemption. God sent his son to live among men and to die and to live again for always. This sinless for the sinner. That's good news. Oh, I don't have time to give you the whole story, but I just want to give you some headlines. Sin is transformed by grace. Hate is surrounded by love. Pride falls before meekness. Death is swallowed up 
by life. Death has no sting. The grave has no victory. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Redemption has reached its widest point. Conversion is cosmopolitan and salvation is full and free. Burdens do become blessings and crosses are exchanged for crowns. Tragedies lead to triumph. Suffering can cause you to seek salvation. Sorrow can become strength. Duty and discipline walk hand in hand. That's good news. And everyone who has heeded uh, this good news and everyone uh, who is serving the Lord, you are telling the story everywhere you go. You are telling others this good news. And if you if you are not telling it to others, then find it for yourself and you will tell it. Do you have a story to tell this morning? When I ask you if you have a story, you ask me if I have one, and I'll tell you, yes. I have a story to tell to the nations. Every man has a date with destiny, a rendezvous with death, and an appointment with God. I have a story to tell. It's a story, it's a message to fallen men. It's greater than Plato's Republic. It's stronger than Moore's utopia. It's more efficient than Marx and socialism. And it will outlast Jefferson's democracy. I have a story to tell. It's a story. It's a message about a birth in Bethlehem, an agony in the garden, and a trial before Pilate. I have a story to tell. It's a story of a thorn crowned brow, nail pierced hands, and a wounded side. I have a story to tell. It's a record of a tragic Friday afternoon, a gloomy Saturday, and a victorious Sunday morning. Thank you for singing my song first. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchase of God. I've been born of his spirit. I've been washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I'm going to tell this story until every city becomes a new Jerusalem. I'm going to tell it until every house becomes a house of prayer. I'm going to tell it until every sinner has been saved by grace. I delight in doing thy will, O Lord. There's joy in telling the story of how Jesus is mighty to save. And I just want you this morning to know that the God loves you, whoever you are, and he's inviting you to come to Jesus. He's inviting you to come to Jesus, receive Jesus as he is. Come to him as you are, and his grace will save you. He didn't tell you to go and talk with anybody else. Just tell it to Jesus. You don't have to go out here and have a conference with anybody. You don't have to go and get somebody to recommend you. Just tell it to Jesus. There are no puzzle to put together. There's no hieroglyphics to decipher. No foreign language to translate. Just believe in him. Stop saying that you've sinned too long and too much. If your sins are like scarlet, he'll make them whiter than snow. Stop saying, oh, I'm just like my father, and, and that's the reason I act like I do. Now remember, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, is what God says. He is able to forgive any individual of his sins. Any individual who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. I invite you to come on to him and do it now. While you can, with the strength that he gives you, walk down the aisle. And while you can, with the power that he gives you, testify of his goodness. And while you can enjoy and know the joy there is in serving him, come on and do it now. Delay is dangerous. Borderline salvation is better than being lost, but that's too dangerous to risk.
That's the reason the prophet said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and he will have mercy to our God, for he will abundantly part. Have you received the gift of salvation that are comes from believing in Jesus Christ. If you haven't, this is your opportunity. Come on to him now. If you're not actively identified uh, with the church, and remember no individual can be in Christ and out of the church at the same time. Come on to him. Surrender your all to him. Let him blot out your transgression. Let him give you power for now and let him give you a bright prospect for the future. 